So now let's talk about x-rays. We have two types of x-rays, continuum and characteristic. We'll talk about continuum first. Consider an electron that's coming down from the SEM column. Normally, this electron is quite fast, quite energetic. A typical beam might be something like 20 kV. So each electron has 20 keV in energy. That electron is approaching the atoms of your specimen. Now, we know your atom has an electron cloud around it. So what we have is a negative charge approaching another negative charge. And one of the things that can happen is when negative approaches negative, there's a force of repulsion, so you can de-accelerate the primary beam electron. Now, energy is conserved. When the beam slows down, that energy has to go somewhere. And for us, it's released as an X-ray photon, light. So energy lost from the beam is released as light, as X-rays in our case. And that's called a continuum X-ray. The reason it's called continuum is it produces a spectrum something like this. Along the X-axis, we've got the X-ray energy. And along the Y-axis, we've got the intensity of the beam, say total number of X-rays. And it forms a continuous spectrum that looks something like a sort of a hump. So any energy in that region is possible. It's a continuous spectrum. What's important is the end of the spectrum, the high energy end of the spectrum. That is referred to as the Duane Hunt limit. The maximum energy of an X-ray that can be produced is when an electron goes from its full speed to a total stop. That's a 100% conversion of energy. So again, if you assume the accelerating voltage of the SM is at 20 kV, each electron is at 20 keV, 100% conversion is the production of a 20 keV X-ray photon. So what we have here in the Duane Hunt limit is an independent experimental verification of the accelerating voltage of the SEM as it lands on your specimen. We talked on the very first slide about quality control. What's important in X-ray analysis is good quality control. One of my first checks to whether I decide to use a spectrum or not is I look at the Duane Hunt limit. I look where the continuum background fades off to zero, where I've got no X-rays being produced. You usually have to project it. That should be very close to the accelerating voltage of the SEM. I don't mind if it's out by a few hundred volts, in 20,000 volts. If the Duane Hunt limit doesn't match the accelerating voltage by a few kV, then you have a problem within the specimen. And that's a spectrum that I wouldn't be using. The actual continuum spectrum generated looks more like that one on the left. We get actually a large number of very low energy X-rays, very close to zero energy. That's because the most likely interaction is for the electron to lose just a small amount of energy. So that's in reality what's generated. But we're experimentalists. We only see what our detector will show us. Our observed spectrum looks something like that. And that's because my X-ray detector is not perfect. And it's very hard for my detector to measure very small energies. And it loses efficiency as it approaches zero energy. And so, in theory, we get more low energy X-rays. So the left graph goes up towards zero. But in reality, what we see is the right graph where the spectrum falls down towards zero rather than goes up. And that's just a measure of the inefficiency of my detector. It's not very sensitive to low energy X-rays, but that's our spectrum. I'll just point out that continuum X-ray is also called bremsstrahlung. That's a common term you'll see in the literature. Let's now talk about characteristic X-rays. These, from the analytical point of view, are the important ones. They tell us what elements are present in our specimen. We all know what an atom looks like. You've got a positive nucleus and you've got electrons around the atom in various orbitals. If we were to do, say, chemistry, then an outer shell electron would be used in bonding, the valence electrons. And that's common for valence electrons to be added or subtracted in chemistry. However, we're going to do something different. By the correct selection of the SEM beam energy, we can produce a situation such that the primary beam 
passes the valence electrons and has an interaction with an inner shell electron. This inner shell electron is ejected from the atom and the primary beam also keeps moving and that leaves a vacancy in the inner shell of the atom. This is a very unstable atom now. And what will happen is an outer shell electron from the atom will jump down and fill that hole in. This electron is losing energy because it's a negative charge going closer to the nucleus, which is a positive charge. Because it's losing energy, the energy has got to be converted. In our case, it's converted to light, in particular an X-ray photon. So we produce an X-ray. And we don't just produce any X-ray. This is now quantum mechanics. That each one of those electrons has a very well-defined energy and the photon released is the exact difference between those two quantum mechanical states. So what we can do is we, if we now look at our characteristic X-ray spectrum, we don't have a continuous background, we have very discrete peaks. And each one of those peaks corresponds to a particular jump within the atom. I normally like to look at the jump where the initial ionization happens in the K shell and the next shell up, the L shell jumps to fill it. We call that a K-alpha X-ray. They're usually quite useful to me. We'll talk more about that later. And so for example, aluminium K-alpha 1.49 keV, silicon K-alpha 1.74, titanium K-alpha 4.5, Iron K-alpha 6.4, copper K-alpha 8. By measuring the X-ray energy produced, we can identify the elements present in the sample. And so these peaks, the energy is measured and they correspond to a known jump. There's of course more than just one jump and this is a nice diagram of many of the jumps possible. Often the jumps are so close in energy that I can't distinguish them apart. So I generally group them. A jump from the L shell down to the K shell is a K alpha. A jump from the M shell down to the K shell is a K beta. From the M shell down to the L shell is an L alpha, so on and so on. I just generally group all those jumps together and they appear beside each other. They're so close in energy, they appear as one line to me. The naming convention is quite simple. You first name the element we are talking about, the atom. And then we name where the initial ionization happens. It's in the K shell, the L shell, the M shell. And then we say where the, the electron jumps down to from above to fill that hole. Generally, one shell up is alpha, two shells up, beta. And that's how we fill in the naming convention. In theory, we get very narrowly defined X-ray lines. But in reality, my detector is not perfect. Sometimes it, it measures them a little bit high, sometimes a little bit low. And that's what we see here. The theoretical ideal situation is on the left, but the real situation, the experimental situation, what we see with our detector is on the right. Our lines are a little bit wider than theory because our detector is not perfect. One of the things we like to do is characterize how good our detector is. Remember, the narrower, the better. So there's this thing called full width at half maximum, FWHM, and it's traditionally measured on a particular X-ray line and they've chosen the manganese K-alpha X-ray line. So what you do is you go to the X-ray line, you measure how high it is, then you go halfway down it and then you measure how wide it is, full width at half maximum. A good modern detector should be about 125 EV resolution. This shows some typical jumps, K-alpha, L-alpha, K-beta. So they're all the jumps that are possible. And of course, the higher the atomic number, the bigger the Z, the more orbitals, the more jumps that are possible. We generally try and always measure jumps that happen somewhere in the inner orbitals. Why? Well, because we've already established that the outer orbitals, the valence shell, is where chemistry ha happens. And we want chemistry to not interfere with our elemental identification. Let's talk about light elements. Hydrogen, helium, they only got one shell. They're the first shell, the K shell. There is no X-rays, there's no second shell for it to happen. The next row of the periodic table, lithium to neon, includes a lot of interesting elements in biology. 
carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. Now this is a difficult thing to measure. There's only two shells, so we can produce an X-ray. But these shells are close in energy, so this X-ray is very weak. And it's very hard for our detector to measure weak X-rays. But on top of that, the outer shell is the L shell, and that's where chemistry is happening. But it's also where our electron for the characteristic X-ray is jumping from. So unfortunately, chemistry and X-ray emission are becoming mixed up a little bit here. If you go to some heavy element, such as iron, where the valence shell is nicely separated from the K and the L shell, an iron K alpha from, say, metal iron, is exactly the same as an iron K alpha from an iron oxide. And so therefore, when I measured that energy X-ray, I'm measuring iron. I don't care if it's metallic or an oxide. There's no bond shift. However, if I'm measuring something like pure carbon, which could be in the form of diamond or graphite, because the L shell has different bonds in diamond versus graphite, even though they're both 100% carbon, the X-ray looks different to me. And I get what's called a bond shift. It's a difficult thing to measure. Unfortunately, my X-ray detector is not so sensitive that I can use this as a spectroscopic technique to identify clearly the type of carbon it is. It's just enough to make the measurement difficult without enough for the measurement to be useful. So light elements, very difficult to measure. So of course, when the primary beam hits the atoms of your specimen, we get both effects happening. We get characteristic X-rays being produced and we get continuum X-rays being produced. And so what we see is we can see the continuum X-rays, we see the characteristic X-rays, this is what we really see with our detector, and we'll see both simultaneously. And both will be joined to produce typical experimental data. And that is what we'll be looking at in X-ray analysis. So next I want to talk about choice of parameters. In particular, the two very important parameters is the accelerating voltage and the probe current, often called the spot size. But we're really not worried so much about resolution. We're limited by the resolution of the interaction volume. So really the probe current, the number of electrons. The accelerating voltage, the energy per electron. What this gives to us is the energy per electron tells us which X-rays we can generate. We can't generate X-rays above the energy of an electron. And the probe current gives us the number of electrons because electrons make X-rays and the X-rays hit the detector. And the detector can only deal with a certain number of X-rays. In particular, it likes to measure one X-ray at a time, and if you give it too many X-rays, it begins to find it hard to get its job done. That's referred to as the dead time. So first, the accelerating voltage, the KV. You need the energy of the beam to be above the energy of the X-ray you're trying to measure. Voltage is energy per unit charge. We know iron K-alpha is 6.4 KeV. K-alpha is when you have a the initial ionisation in the K shell and the next shell up, the L shell electron drops down to fill it up. I can easily operate an SEM at 5 kV and get a, p a good picture of steel, which is 99% iron, yet if I went and analysed that steel at 5 kV, I would get no iron K alpha x-rays. However, if I went up to 15 kV, I would get iron K alpha x-rays. And again, you can image at voltages that you cannot perform analysis at. In particular, there's a thing called the overvoltage. There's lookup tables, all through the internet, periodic tables, that give the major X-ray lines of all the elements. Basically, start with the elements you are interested in, look at the major X-ray lines that they produce. Usually you want something, if possible, above 1 keV in energy, but below 15 keV in energy really below, ideally below 10 keV in energy. They're the good X-ray lines to try and measure. And then find the X-ray line that represents the element you're interested in and then double it. Look up its energy and double it. To me, that's the minimum accelerating voltage you can use. I usually round up to the nearest five. The optimum accelerating voltage is three times that energy. 
Look at uh, iron K alpha, 6.4, let's call it 6. Three sixes are 18, two sixes are 12. To me, for iron, I want to be at least 15 and ideally 20 kV. This is the overvoltage. You need to be above that energy in the beam to stimulate X-ray production. Three times is ideal, that gives the maximum. Beyond three times, the cross-section of ionisation changes and it begins to fall off. You get less and less X-rays produced. But the, the growth is fast, the fall off is very, very, very slow. And you really only begin to notice it in things like transmission electron microscopes, TEMs, where you're at two or 300 kV, and then you see a different sort of effect. Let's look at this example. Just say I have a material that's made up of silicon and copper. Silicon K-alpha is at 1.7 kV, copper K-alpha, 8 kV. If I operated the electron microscope at 12 kV accelerating voltage, I would fully stimulate the silicon, but I would under stimulate the copper. So my copper emission would be weak. Same specimen, and if I increase the accelerating voltage to 25 kV, again, silicon would be fully stimulated. Not much change in the silicon, but the copper would now be much better stimulated. 3 8 to 24, 25 is about perfect. And then the copper peak would grow significantly relative to the silicon peak. Now you often see people do that. They, they put the specimen in the electron microscope. They may not have really decided logically on the accelerating voltage. And they look at their peak heights. And they go, this peak is higher than that peak. Therefore, I have more of this than that. You can't do that. It's not so simple. It may be one material, the relative peak height can change enormously depending on the accelerating voltage selected. So you've got to make sure you, you select the correct accelerating voltage. And when you're comparing data from another person or another experimental run, to compare them correctly, you must be at the same accelerating voltage. Most SEMs will go up to 30 kV. Why doesn't everyone just operate the SEM at 30 kV? Well, there's two reasons. One reason is your specimen may not be able to handle it. If you're doing biology or polymer science, you want to use the, the minimum voltage possible to get the results required. The other reason is you might have fairly small grains. And as you increase the accelerating voltage, you increase the interaction volume. And for analysis to work well, you want all the electron interaction volume to be within the single grain you're trying to analyze. So volume is a function of accelerating voltage. Here's one material. At 5 kV, there's my interaction volume. 20 kV, 30 kV. As I increase the accelerating voltage, I will increase the interaction volume. Don't forget, the beam is coming down in nanometers, but my interaction volume is probably in microns. So these changes are now quite significant. Here's some actual calculations I've done for you. All of them are 20 kV, but you'll see the interaction volume in something dense like gold is about half a micron, and in something like carbon, four and a half microns. In between, silicon, three and a half microns. These are real figures. I ran some Monte Carlo simulations to calculate them. You can also use a formula called Castang's approximation. We're not gonna delve into calculating interaction volumes of Monte Carlo simulations. However, there's a lot of information out there. If you need to know more, contact me and I will give you some reference points or if you're UQ student, we can meet and have a talk. Accelerating voltage gives you the x-rays and the size of the analysis. The beam current, the number of electrons, is really adjusted with the spot size and that is how you tune the detector to be operating in the way you want it to operate. So there's your x-ray detector. Basically, if two x-rays hit it very close to each other, the x-ray detector can't tell them apart. There's an error there, so the x-ray detector rejects both x-ray measurements and they don't make it to the output of the detector. This is called dead time and it's usually um, given as an output of dead time or DT percent. It's the percentage of time which the detector is rejecting data. I've seen situations where someone has a very high accelerating voltage, a very high beam current on a very dense specimen. They can see a beautiful SEM image, 
yet they're getting no x-ray data out. And the reason is the detector has so many x-rays hitting it that everything is being rejected and it's operating at 100% dead time. So what you must do, you don't want 100% dead time. You want the dead time roughly somewhere I like to be between 5% and 50%. And what you do is you adjust the beam current. Too many x-rays means too many electrons. Reduce the spot size, turn the beam current down, spread out the x-ray data, the dead time will fall and you'll start getting good output. So you want your x-rays to be well separated, you look at your dead time, you adjust the spot size. There's two types of analysis, qualitative analysis and quantitative analysis. Energy dispersive x-ray spectrometer, so EDX or EDS, same thing. That's what's traditionally fitted to an SEM. There's your specimen, it's made of atoms, and then what you do is the SEM will put an electron beam on top of it. We've chosen the right accelerating voltage, and now we tune the spot size to get the right dead time. We produce x-rays, which we measure well with our x-ray detector, usually an EDS detector. And then what we'll get is we'll get an X-ray spectrum. X is the X-ray energy, Y is the X-ray intensity. Usually in either total X-rays, or sometimes we work in counts per second, X-ray counts per second, so we normalize to time. And you'll see a number of peaks. This is a simple spectrum. Most elements produce a few peaks, but let's look at the major peaks. These peaks represent an element. And your job is to identify which element they represent, there's lookup tables, but there's also the computer that has the EDS detector on it, has all this data in it, and you match the peak to an element, and then you can say, my specimen has these three elements on it. That's called qualitative analysis. It's a basic yes or no. Yes, I have these elements. No, I don't have these elements. Be careful when you say no. If you look at my spectrum there, I do not see any titanium. Yet titanium will be a nice x-ray, you know, above aluminium, below copper, easily stimulated. If someone said, did you see titanium? I would never say, no, there's no titanium there. You know, because when I say there's no titanium there, I've actually given a number to it. I've said there's zero titanium there. But my detector's not perfect. It won't measure to parts per billion. Other techniques can. So there might be a very small amount of titanium there I'm not picking up. So the general answer is none was detected. That's the correct answer. If you can see it, you know it's there. But if you don't see it, it may be there below the detection limit. So we say none was detected. Most people don't really want to know yes or no answers to elements. What they really want to know is how much do I have? And that's called quantitative analysis. It's a much higher quality answer, but it also means there's a higher quality requirement on the specimen. The specimen needs to be flat, homogeneous, or homogeneous, whichever way you prefer to say it, beam stable and void free over the analytical volume. And the analytical volume will tend to be one to two microns in all three dimensions. That's what you've got to give me in order to be able to do good quantitative analysis. This is quantitative analysis. You first, again, get the X-ray spectrum. You label the peaks. You identify the elements that are present. And then you hit the matrix correction button, the ZAF button, the quantitative button. Each software has a different name, but it's the same effect. And that will turn the peaks into corrected elemental concentrations. Be careful. Depending on how it's set up, the output will either be in atomic percent or weight percent. Maybe atomic percent can be referred to as mole percent and maybe sometimes weight percent is referred to as, as mass percent. But generally, people like chemists and physicists tend to think of atomic percent. They're trying to work out a formula Whereas people like geologists and metallurgists and material scientists tend to, in a metallurgy foundry, you tend to weigh how much element you're putting into the mix and they work in weight percent. They can be quite different. I was working on some lead oxide that was stoichiometric PBO, one lead atom to one oxygen atom. Yet, when I worked it out as a mass percent, 
the vast majority of the mass was in the lead and there was hardly any mass in the oxygen. So the two numbers can be different. Just be aware of what numbers you're working in. So that's easily done on the SEM. I'll just show you how you would do it easily. And then we're going to talk more about the details of how you can do it well with more control. Generally, on an SEM with an EDS detector, certainly within the CMM Hawken lab at the University of Queensland, the EDS is done in what we call standardless quant or semi-quant mode. What that means is we don't really run standards. We just use the system as it came calibrated from the factory when I brought the detector. That makes life very quick. We can get on and get data very quick. But it's always normalised to 100%. It's hard to gauge error. If you want to go to full standards, I tend to run a different piece of equipment called a microprobe, EPMA, and that's where I will actually run reference standards and do a high quality analysis. And I will use different detectors, but it's the standards that are important there. Standardless quantum EDS. This is how the average person will use it. You put your specimen in the SEM at the correct accelerating voltage that you've already calculated, you'll get yourself an image. You, it will be a backscatter image. Ideally, the specimen will be polished and the grains will be bigger than a micron. Each different grayscale in the backscatter image is a different material. You then put the beam on the different materials and for each one of those regions, you will get an X-ray spectrum. You will then label the peaks to correspond to the elements required. Some machines require that you manually label them. Other machines will automatically label it for you. But you need to check. This is your research and you need to make sure the peaks are correct. There are some overlaps that do exist. Lead, moly and sulphur have a big overlap. Fluorine K-alpha can have an overlap with an iron L-alpha. If I got a peak there that looks like fluorine and I saw one just yesterday, the question was, is it fluorine or is it iron? But I was at 15 kV, more than enough to stimulate an iron K-alpha, that iron K-alpha was not present, that was a fluorine peak. So sometimes you have to do a little bit of thinking detective work. The computer will make a decision for you, but this is your research. You need to put your decision on it. Once you've labelled the peaks, you push a button. This is automated and you will do a matrix correction or ZAF correction. And that will produce the corrected weight percent. I'm going to just work in weight percent from now on because that's what most people who use the technique work on. But I'm happy to flick to atomic percent as required. And that is what you can do really within a few minutes in the SEM. And that's quick and that's easy. And the reason it's quick and it's easy is the calibration of the detector was done at the factory, not by you and not even this detector. Some nominal detector back at the factory and they've loaded that calibration to our detector. How good is standardless quant? Basically, everyone wants to do standardless quant because it's quick and easy. But then they ask me, how good is it? By the way, the reason they want to do it is because I can do standardless quant within minutes on an SEM. However, if I'm going to run my own standards on the microprobe, the EPMA, high quality work, but generally, I'm looking at at least six, maybe 24 hours to get the work done on a probe with my own standards. So it's a lot more labour intensive. Like anything in analysis, you only know how accurate your answer is by putting in something where you already know what the answer is. Here, I used an SRM, a standard reference material. I got this from NIST in the United States. And this is a well-known reference material. It's a reference stainless steel. In yellow, let's look at the top one. In yellow on the left, that is the nominal value as produced by NIST. And that's good numbers. We take that as the truth. And they spent a lot of effort getting good material with good numbers. And then let's look at something like nickel. NIST said there was, this is in mass percent or weight percent, there was 12.1 weight percent nickel. When I measured it, I actually got 11.86% nickel. That's not too bad. In terms of absolute error, my absolute error was 0.24 weight percent. But relative, my relative error was 2%. That's not too bad. You often hear people say, oh, standardless EDS, it's good to 2%, you know, 2 to 5%. Well, it's true, but if you look at my relative errors here, 
This one is good to 2%. The one below it, copper, 26%. The one below that, moly, 17%. Basically, the smaller the concentration, the bigger the relative error. Small concentrations are the hardest things to measure. Anything above 10%, that's not a light element, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, you should be able to measure with a fair degree of accuracy, say two to five percent. Once you start getting below 10 percent into minor elements, or worse yet, below one percent in trace element, the error goes up. This steel has 0.046 percent carbon. That's a very small amount of carbon. And I gave the value X here. I didn't measure carbon. That was a conscious decision. Why? Because no SEM is contamination free. And the most common source of contamination is oils and greases, either from the, the pumps, the mechanical gears, or your finger grease as it goes inside the machine. And these are organic hydrocarbons. They break down under the electron beam and they deposit a layer of carbon on the surface of your specimen. This Surface carbon is false. It's a contamination. This is the same data, I only did one thing. I labelled carbon. I said, yes, carbon does exist. And then I hit the quantitative button again. Because it's standardless quant or semi-quant, it always normalises to 100%. Now, I measured seven weight percent carbon. It's all wrong. It's just surface contamination. And because it's not into the specimen, it gets overrepresented. However, because it normalizes to 100%, this erroneous 7%, which is really 7% too high, has to come from somewhere. So whereas before, nickel, which was 11.86% as a measurement, that now drops down to 10.94%. My absolute error increases to 1.17%, and my relative error increases to 9.6%. This is the same data set, I only acquired one spectrum. So my relative error for nickel has gone from 2% to 9.6%. Why? Because I got one element wrong. That's the thing you've got to understand with analysis. You need to get everything right. And as soon as one element is wrong, all the rest of the elements become wrong with it. I often hear people say, standardless EDS, good to 2%. Well, yes it is, there you go, there's 2% error there, that's nice. But, then look at my carbon, when I did it wrong, I've now got a 16,000% relative error. So somewhere between 2% and 16,000% is the truth. It depends on the specimen, depends on the element, depends on the concentration, and it depends on the analysis and how you process the data. Believe it or not, the processing of the data and the decision making is the most important input. When people often get bad results, they ask me for a better machine when what they really need to do is better analysis of their spectral data.